Good morning, Greenspring. I'm your host today, Avon Price, and today we're talking about comic books. And let me give you a little background. The first Saturday in, in the month of May, every comic book store has a free comic book day. And so that means that you can go in and get a free comic book and on any storyline that you want. So I missed it this year because I was too busy sparring and I totally forgot about it, but I thought it would be a good idea to go over five of my favorite comic book storylines. Now, I picked some that are uh, PG. There are some very dark uh, comic book storylines, but you know, I don't want to scare anyone. I want to give everyone a nightmare. So I kept it fairly um, rated PG. So I'm going to be crossing between both Marvel Comics and DC Comics. So the first one on my list is called Teen Titans and the Judas Contract. Now, if you look at this cover here, it's coming from the 1980s. And this is a very story famous storyline with the Teen Titans. And the Teen Titans are the sidekicks of the main superheroes like Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash. And it's all their sidekicks and they come together and form a group called the Teen Titans. And this comic book storyline is very famous for, very, for various reasons. If you go to the next picture, You'll see this picture is kind of small, but it's the best one I could find of this particular issue. It's Nightwing. And if you remember from previous episodes, Nightwing is Batman's first sidekick and his own persona as a new superhero. So in this comic book was the first debut of the Nightwing superhero name of Dick Grayson. And if you look at the costume, it's not my favorite costume, but it's a very famous costume on how it has the feather looks and all the multicolors. So that is a, um, one of the reasons why this is a very well-known comic book is because the debut of Nightwing, the Nightwing character. The next photo, you see the kind of the main storyline. And the main storyline is the person to the left is named Deathstroke. Deathstroke is given a contract to take out the Teen Titans. And so the way he does this is the first he had his son uh, I believe his name was Jethro. I could be Jericho. His name was Jericho. He had his son Jericho be a spy in the Teen Titans group, but he backfired. He actually liked the group and didn't help his father. So he enlists the young lady to the right named Tara. Tara has the ability to move matter in the earth under her. And so she joined the Teen Titans as a spy to learn their weaknesses and to learn all their strengths and everything that makes them vulnerable. So when he is ready to strike, he knows how to take them out. So the next picture, you'll kind of see who the Teen Titans are made up of. Now this switches out um, depending on the storyline and the year, but for this particular comic book issue, you have Cyborg, who is the robotic looking man. You have Beast Boy, who is the green boy. The one flying in the top left corner, that's Starfire, who is an alien. You have Raven, Wonder Girl, Jericho in the bottom right, and then you have Nightwing, who we just saw. So this is, these are the main Teen Titan characters who are in this comic book storyline that the young lady Tara joins to secretly become a spy and taking them out. So as you see in the next picture coming up, this is the more updated version. So they recently created a movie of the Judas contract of the characters to promote this storyline. And so you see Tara to the right, the one in black and red is Nightwing, Starfire, Beast Boy, and a new character called Beast Boy. So this is kind of the lineup for the new generation of this storyline. So the next couple of pictures I have are just pictures of you seeing the comic book story and the fight between Tara and Raven. And if you keep going for the next two, you just see different photos of them fighting her and Slade as they're coming. And this is a very well-known storyline because it's very emotional. And this is the first time that these teenagers face a true betrayal within their team and their teammates so it's a very good storyline so if you're ever out there looking for a comic book for your grandkids your great grandkids this one's relatively rated G and I think they'll enjoy it so the clip I chose is from the recent movie Teen Titans and the Judas Contract of when Deathstroke the assassin fights um, Nightwing after Nightwing has discovered all his teammates have gone missing so let's check it out Day Nightwing. It's about to get worse. What have you done with Corey and the others? Don't fret. I'm here to take you to them. Spring. Akito needs work. Your space is. Your 
overrated kid. Damn it. Enough. Screw this. You could have died by the blade with honor, Grayson. Loser. As you see there, um, I love this movie. I thought they did really well with merging a classic story from the 80s and bringing it up to a modern version in 2000. I think it came out in 2017 or 2018. I think they did a really good job of merging the two um, time periods together. And what I love also about that movie is my favorite Robin is involved in it, the Damian Wayne version of Robin. So if you ever in the store and you see the movie, I totally recommend buying it and watching it. So the next um, comic book story I want to bring up is called Planet Hulk. If you're not familiar, Planet um, Hulk is the green monster Bruce Banner when after doing gamma ray experimentation gets hit with a huge overdose and he becomes the infamous Raging Hulk. And so Planet Hulk is the storyline of when Earth got totally tired of Hulk breaking everything. And so if you see, the, and so after they shipped him to another planet, he ended up somewhere way beyond the galaxies and he becomes um, a warrior gladiator on this other planet. So if you go to the next picture, you'll see some pictures of him in his uniform. So this is the infamous look of him with his helmet, and then he has a shield and a staff. And even though he's brutally strong, they still give him weapons. And so he becomes a gladiator for this alien planet uh, as he's being abused and um, taken captive. So just keep turning pictures, you'll see. And what I wanted to bring up is in the recent Marvel movie, the Thor Ragnarok movie that came out maybe about two years ago, they reference Hulk because in the Marvel movies, he disappeared. Appeared. So this storyline is still very new. I think it came out around 2009. And so as you see, Hulk just totally is a gladiator within the strange planet. And eventually he breaks loose, becomes king of the planet and starts ruining the planet. And so I think things turned out for him pretty well. So even though the earth didn't want him, he still hulked it out and made the best of it. So the clip I showed, I picked from it is from um, the animation version of Hulk, um, Planet Hulk, and this is a scene when he's fighting Beta, Beta Ray Bill. And if you don't know who Beta Ray Bill is, Beta Ray Bill is kind of a twisted version of the character Thor. So he has the same hammer like Thor, looks like Thor, but he's kind of an animal looking creature. So he's super strong and super a good fighter. So let's see what happens when they both um, meet each other. Hulk. I know of you. The halls of Asgard echo with tales of your rage. They ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> I act by the will of others, Hulk. The disc in my chest and in yours demand that one of us must die. You have my sympathy because it will not be me! Oh! <laughs> 
<sighs> you broke the disc. I'm free. <laughs> All right, I had to cut it right there because um, um, Hulk beats him to a bloody mess. So I didn't want to ruin your breakfast this morning. So one thing I want to mention about the storylines that I'm going over, there's a thing in comics called a canon storyline, which is the main storyline that the comic books follow. A lot of these storylines I'm bringing up are off canon, meaning it's off the main storyline, it's an Elseworlds story, or it's just some random story with these characters that someone thought up. So there's not, not all necessarily the main storyline. So just giving you some background on this um, comic book lingo. All right, so the next storyline I have is the Dark Phoenix. Now, if anyone knows me, my favorite group of superhero team that comes together is the X-Men. I love Justice League, I love Team Titans, but the X-Men is my favorite. Just the idea of a bunch of superheroes with different powers coming together is a wonderful idea. So the Phoenix storyline, um, is one of the, my favorite stories of the X-Men. If you go to the next picture, to understand this, we're gonna have to go slow with it. So first of all, it starts off with the main character, Jean Grey. Jean Grey is already a high rank uh, powered superhero. She has the ability of telekinesis, uh, telepathy. She has the ability to move matter and to manipulate matter on her own. She is highly ranked in the, in the, in the mutant category as an omega level mutant. And so she's already a powerful mutant on her own. And so next picture is you'll see her lover is Scott Summers. They have a very strong bond with one another. They were both, um, adopted into the Xavier Institute or the house that they grew up in to become this mutant team, the X-Men. They, the, they are the original members and they are lovers. And because Jean Grey has a telepathic powers, their love is actually really stronger than the actual normal human being because of her telepathic powers. And so that's very essential within the Dark Phoenix storyline. The next picture is just another picture of them working together side by side. As you see, Scott Summer has optic beams coming out of his eyes. They're actually very powerful that they can actually shoot through um, a mountain which is in the comic world a very powerful thing so the next photo you see her as the Phoenix and now the Phoenix Force is an entity from space uh, one day when they were on a space mission they were trying to save an astronaut crew where this cosmic energy which is the fire which is actually a li living energy called the Phoenix Force comes and dwells within Jean Grey so as you can say she is possessed by an alien Phoenix Force and the combination of her high power power already and this alien force creates the phoenix if you see her in this green suit you know that she's on the good side but what happens is when she turns red is that the alien within her or the force within her starts loving all the human emotions that we enjoy you know even though we don't promote violence there is a thrill in the human emotion that enjoys violence so there's things that she's never experienced through the phoenix force that she uses jean gray's body to experience and so with the phoenix force she is ranked as one of the top three powerful mutants in the whole marvel universe so that tells you how ranked she becomes in this universe so the clip i chose is when professor x uh, from the the X-Men has to have a mutant battle, a mental battle with this Phoenix Force. Now to understand what happens is when you are a telepath within the realm of comic books, you are able to throw your mind into another dimension, which they call the astral plane, where on this astral plane, the psychics battle and they fight one another. So this is what's going to happen. And so I'll explain more as, after this clip. You once told Jean Grey that the greatest joy a teacher has is to be surpassed by his own pupil. Enjoy! Stop! I won't allow you to Half enter my... Ah! In the battlefield of the mind, my will shall prevail. Do you really think your puny mind is a match for mine? As you once used the power of the Phoenix to bind the Emkron crystal, I now bind the Phoenix with the power of... The 
fate of you humans! The arrogance! King, if you can hear me, help me! Help me! Help me! This can't be! I am Phoenix! I now bind the Phoenix with the power of my mind! So what's really powerful about this storyline is that it's the X-Men fighting a beloved X-Men member. Cyclops, as you saw in the beginning when I was talking about her love interest, he has to make the harsh decision of I have to fight at the time my wife and try to stop her before she kills the planet. Now there's more things that happen in the storyline that even though they mentally block the power within her, she destroyed another alien son, and so that alien race comes and captures Jean Grey and holds her prisoner and try to kill her, you know, based off a trial that they held for her, and they said she was sentenced to death. And so the X-Men try to fight on her behalf, and it reawakens that dark phoenix within her. So it's a very famous storyline within the X-Men comic book um, of, the, of just how tragic it is to have to fight against another team member. So, moving on. Now, if you know anything about me, I'm going to have to mention Batman. I had a lot of, of stories to choose from, but I chose to choose The Killing Joke because, in my opinion, it's one of the most menacing stories. And The Killing Joke has many different um, highlights in it that make it a very famous storyline. One, uh, story, one of the famous things about it, go to the next picture, is that it um, gives the most information of the Joker's background. One of the things that make the Joker a very interesting villain is that no one really knows his true background or his true origin story. And this gives the most background behind what his origin story is. And quickly, I'm going to tell you that he's based, his origin story is that he was a poor, broke, failing comedic with a pregnant wife on the way. And so his origin story is he tries to hook up with some gangsters in order to rob a place to get some money so him and his wife can have some money. But in the time of him doing all that, he gets captured, goes to jail, and his wife who's pregnant dies with the baby. So all this tragic tragedy that happens mentally breaks him. And so within the storyline, it asks the question of what will mentally break you and make you insane? And so another key point in the storyline is Barbara Gordon gets shot and paralyzed. If you don't know who Barbara Gordon is, she is the daughter of Jim Gordon, the commissioner, and Batgirl. So this is the famous storyline of when Batgirl becomes paralyzed and then she becomes the Oracle or the, commu co the computer master behind of all the Bat family's operation. And so the next picture is where it gets really dark. The Joker kidnaps Jim Gordon, and then he psychologically, psychologically tortures him. He strips him naked and then surrounds him with pictures of his daughter as she's dying on the floor. And so his main quest is to prove to Jim Gordon that all it takes is for one moment to make everyone mentally snap. So that is the main gist of the, of the um, killing joke. They made a movie about it three years ago, and I have to say the movie was awful. They didn't do... The, they didn't do it justice like the comic book. The comic book was way better, but it just didn't translate properly into the movie. And I have to read something to you. Um, I read some kind of uh, report from the writers and kind of like a literature um, analysis of this book because it's a really well-known story within the comic, books, um, comic book world. And it says, the book explores Moore's um, assertion that psychologically Batman the Joker are mirror images of each other. By dwelling into the relationship between the two, the story itself shows how the Joker and Batman come to terms with their respective life alternating tragedies, which both eventually lead to their present lives in confrontation. Critic Jeff Clark further explained that both Batman and the Joker are creations of a random and tragic one bad day. And this whole thing of one bad day is something as a theme within this storyline. Batman spends his whole life forging meaning from the random tragedy, whereas the Joker reflects the absurdity of life and all its random injustice. I just thought that was a good kind of um, analysis of the storyline. And like I said, the storyline is basically Joker trying to prove to Batman and Jim Gordon 
internet. All it takes is one moment to make you snap. And at the same time, Batman is considering, have I really done my part to try to help the Joker? So, cause I don't want to be like him. So the Batman is, is fearing that one day he might actually turn into the Joker. So the clip I chose is kind of short, but it shows Batman reaching out to Joker instead of punching him in the face. So let's look at it. God damn it. Well, what are you waiting for? Kick the hell out of me and get your standing ovation. Come on! No, not this time. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want either of us to end up killing the other. But we're running out of alternatives. Perhaps it all hinges on tonight. I don't know what it was that bent your life out of shape, but maybe I've been there too. Maybe we could work together. I could rehabilitate you. You don't need to be alone. We don't have to kill each other. Let me help you. I'm sorry, but no. No, it's far too late for that. So I gotta tell you, I'm gonna do a spoiler alert for you kind of towards the end. There's um, at the end in this very controversial ending of when the Joker tells Batman to laugh. And one thing you know about the Joker, he says all these other jokes all the time and Batman never laughs. And so the Joker tells Batman a joke and then Batman actually starts laughing with the Joker. And within the comic book, as they're laughing together, the comic book drawings pan to the ground and stuff and it leaves only Batman laughing. And the last time you see Batman is moving his hands towards the Joker's neck. So it causes the issue of, did Batman kill Joker? Did he choke him out? Or did Batman just have the last laugh? Did Batman finally turn into the Joker? So it's actually a very, debate like people have debates about the storyline i'll say when i went to comic con way back um when was it maybe four years ago we brought up this issue because uh, they were handing out the you know the books for the killing joke and i remember me and this random guy started talking about did batman kill the joker i said no because batman doesn't kill and then they use this storyline for the canon storyline so joker was later there so i don't think he killed him but that's for another debate. I need a real comic book person to be here in the chair with me for us to have this debate. So my last and final um, storyline that I have is the death of Superman. Now, I know some of you are probably like, what? There's no way that Superman can die. Oh, yes, he can. Superman does have weaknesses, including kryptonite, and he's vulnerable to magic. But the death of Superman is the storyline of when a monster from space named Doomsday comes and fights Superman with everything he has. Go to the next picture for me. As you see, this is the old style um, comic book of them fighting one another, and it is a brawl. It goes throughout the whole city. It lasts for hours of them, these juggernauts fighting each other. I think the way they say it, um, an unstoppable force meets like a move immovable object. So they're both fighting each other. And this is the famous Lois Lane crying over the body of Superman. And so most of you probably know who Superman is and that he is an alien from space that when he comes to Earth is because his planet has died or has exploded and his powers come from soaking up the radiation of the sun, gives him flight, super healing, super strength and all that kind of stuff. And this is the monster doomsday. Now there's various storylines on the origin of Doomsday. There's origins that Doomsday is actually the aboriginals from the planet Krypton of where Superman is from, or that he is from Darkseid, another monster making him. But nonetheless, he is a monster that has super strength, super invulnerability, and one interesting fact about him is that every time you kill Doomsday, when he comes back, you cannot kill him the same time, like the same way. Let's say you stabbed him, you, he will come back to life and create a, like a protection against stabbing. You cannot kill him the same way twice. 
Um, it, and so as you see, there's another picture of them just fighting toe to toe. So um, the storyline is the death of Superman of when all the Justice League members were trying to fight this monster, but they could not stop him. Doomsday has no thoughts. He has no reason. He is literally a fighting machine. And so I had all my clips be a little bit short for you to see this last clip of when, Def when Superman dies. I mean, it's called the death of Superman, so Superman's going to die. So let's check it out and then we'll sum it up. I know, it's very emotional, it's very sad. I mean, our cameraman Tim was saying, is this the Titanic? There's one thing you gotta know about comics. They're both emotional and there's a lot of fighting and there's a lot of action within it. And I remember watching this, this movie came out last year. And I remember watching it and I'm like the entire time, oh, Superman, don't die, but yet it's called The Death for Superman. I think it's a very well done movie. I highly recommend going, seeing it and reading the comic book. There's been several iterations of The Death of Superman. There was one that came out way back in 2005 around then. And then of course the Batman versus Superman movie um, came out and then it showed kind of the, the, kind of touched upon The Death of Superman with the Doomsday. But this animation that came out last, last year is the best rendition of this storyline and like all things in comic books they are not dead for real they always come back one way or another i was telling my co-worker uh, terrence that death in comic books is like taking a nap you're going to come back one way or another except gwen stacy and spider-man they kept that one dead but anyways i hope you enjoyed some of my list of my favorite storybook um comic book storylines and if you have anyone that you like come and tell me and we can debate about it and we can see which one is better 